Yeah, definitely. No question. Okay, then. So the focus for this uh, lecture is on those two stories. Um, Evidence by Az Asimov and by Roald Dahl, we have Lamb to the Slaughter. But it's, there's no expectation that you've read these stories so far. The whole purpose of World Scholars Cup is, like we can see here from Bugs Bunny to our Fudd, is to get you thinking, okay? And to get you thinking in ways that are creative and unusual. And we far rather that in World Scholars Cup, that you think of ideas that are creative and unusual than necessary with these texts to treat it like pure literature where you're analyzing in massive detail. We're more about the ideas than the style. Okay. So the first question, and this is, this is a question that really came to me at university and stuck with me massively since. Throughout all my youth, I really believed that truth was obviously the most important thing that we were always on this mission to seek for the truth. But as I grew older, I came across more and more scenarios and ideas in literature where actually the effect of something is more important than the truth. Now, Elliot, earlier you was talking about how you thought how um, effect was more important than truth. Make a statement about that. Why do you think that's the case? Oh. Are you under pressure? Uh, I don't really. I guess that um, some truth is not always going to be best. It's not really always going to be effective. It's not always going to solve the problem. While effect, not. I don't really know. I think effect just it always delivers. Kind of. Okay, so it, effect is something of what's been actually delivered was truth. Yeah. truth even though it exists, it may not actually have an effect or even yeah. be real for certain people. Mm. Bronte, what are your initial thoughts about the idea of truth versus effect? How would you see that argument? Well, I was thinking more of how, of, of the effect of truth. Like, it, it is different for different people, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, truth is set and that's, that's what it is, but effect differs for different people. Wonderful. And there's questions that we we'll look at today as in, is effect something that we discover? Is it something that we create? And if it's something we discover, or if, it, if it's something that we create, what difference does that make? So I want to introduce you here to a wonderful um, opening quotation to the story uh, evidence. And it says, uh, if he told you that, you would send for a straitjacket. So it's talking about whether or not this politician uh, is a robot, if he's actually not a real human being. But if he tells you he never sleeps, he never eats, then the shock of the statement blinds you to the fact that such statements are impossible to prove. So this is actually from the point of view of the supposed robot or politician figure. He says, you play into his hands by contributing to the to-do. So he's talking about this idea of when someone suggests an idea to you, it can seize in your mind and it stops you from questioning it in a critical way. So the whole purpose of our time that we're spending together for the next 35 minutes or so is to explore how these two stories are nodes for provocative ideas on morality, truth, and authenticity. Just to show you what this really means, these are nodes. So all our different ideas are joined together in the purpose of a story. And one wonderful thing that Ms. Flemmer said to me was the following, that when she was going for her interview for Oxford University, and they asked her, why do you enjoy literature? She said, I love literature because it's like the point at which every single subject can be spoken about. Now, any story that you can read, or like if you read every story eventually like that, that you can, every possible subject can be discussed or thought about within those stories. Just like this. And of course, if you look at that last word, being authentic, is it desirable for there to, for there to be only one image of authenticity? And how, how important is it to be authentic? Okay. Obviously, Donald Trump and Adolf Hitler were very authentic people. You know, by itself, it's not, you know, an admirable quality necessarily. So as part of this, and as part of like War Scholars' Awesome Brains, we need to focus on their questions itself. So from the crime and justice area, I thought these two questions were quite interesting. Can a criminal be a hero? And also, should all countries follow the same legal code? Now Bronte, like you said um, about two or three minutes ago, what's true for one person may not be true for somebody else. And when laws, particularly laws that might enact death upon other people, mm -hmm. if those laws are arbitrary, if they differ between countries, what does that say about the morality of those laws, you know, if they're right or wrong? Okay, that's a big question. History of cheating. Wonderful lecture recently with uh, Mr. Bacon. And there's been another great lecture coming up with Mr. Nash about this. I thought there were two great quotations that linked to um, the story evidence in particular. First one, are we morally obligated to report any cheaters we encounter? And the next one, second uh, last, should cheating disqualify a politician from winning elected office? And how about lying? Now, until I looked at this this lecture and until I thought of these, these stories, my obvious answer was, of course, you know, 
politicians need to be absolutely blameless. They need to say the truth all the time. But actually, I think that's not a realistic response necessarily. Elliot, what are you thinking? When you when you can when a politician lies, he doesn't really maybe so he doesn't really believe he's lying. He believes he's going to tell the truth. Bronte, what, really. did, what did Elliot just say? He said that politician believes he's telling the truth. Okay. Yes. Or maybe even when a politician lies, they know they're lying. And the audience knows they're lying, but, good. but they're saying this kind of lie, this, this, this twist of the truth, and everyone knows the twist of the truth, but we all kind of buy into it for a certain effect. Maybe, and we're gonna see some of these ideas. Then finally, if we look at um, when states falter as well, if you were the leader of a failed threat of state, whom would, whom, whom would you ask for help? And there's a traditional concept, the state outdated in the age of globalization and the internet. Now this story was written um, over, over 50 years ago, but the points it makes about who we want to rule us are very powerful and, and quite scary as well. So first of all, the first story, Lamb to the Slaughter. Okay? This meme here of Yes Baby is the whole story. A wife kills her husband with a leg of lamb and she gets the police officers to eat the leg of lamb and therefore getting away with the murder. Okay? This raises the question of can a criminal be a hero? Is there ever a reason for a wife to kill her husband? Okay, our other story, evidence by Isaac Asimov, it's very interesting because Asimov, um, he, was, um, he was a great genius writer. His style was stark, was plain. He didn't believe in writing in this massively metaphorical style. Instead, he believed in ideas. So his stories are really about posing ideas to us. Okay, um, and his story is like this. A politician is considered to be, um, is considered to be a robot, uh, but it's never proven. So the whole story is about people trying to prove that this guy, this, this attorney who's, who's running for um, uh, this role as politician, is a robot, but they can't prove it. And again, it raises this question, should someone who is lying be disbarred from office, even if they're lying, makes them A, a better politician, and B, makes a better society for everybody else? Okay, then. so just a more detailed plot about the first story, Lamb to the Slaughter. So a wife is sitting at home and she's pregnant, and she seems rather pensive. The husband comes home and the wife is really keen and, uh, to please him. He's very dismissive. He drinks some of his alcohol and he reveals that he's going to divorce her. There's this gesture of affair, but it's not openly said. She goes to the fridge, takes out his frozen leg of lamb and smashes him over the skull, killing him instantly. At which point she then decides to create a false alibi by heading down to the grocer's and then coming back and finding the dead body of her husband, calls up their mutual friends, because her husband is also a, a, an inspector, and the inspectors come round, they're trying to discover who's killed the husband, she cooks the lamb that she's used to kill her husband with, and, and they eat it. Okay. Um, in terms of evidence, uh, Quinn and Lanning, who are two opposing politicians, they're discussing whether Bialy, who's the hero protagonist, is a robot or not. And by robot we mean this, that he looks like a human being. Like the Terminator character, he's got flesh and blood skin around him, okay? You literally cannot tell he's a robot by looking at him. He's also got a brain that allows him to, on the outset, appear to be entirely human, okay? He appears to have emotions. It's impossible for any human being to know whether that person's a robot or not, because he's so advanced. Um, the story then discusses this idea about robot morality. In fact, I'll show this to you now, okay? Now, Isaac Asimov, as I said to you before, is much more about ideas in the story. And he has these three key ideas. And these three key ideas are essential because they run throughout not just his work, but the work of a lot of writers afterwards. So the first one is this. A robot may not injure a human being or allow them to come to harm through an action. And that's the number one law. What would be the problem with robots and artificial intelligence if that law didn't exist? Elliot. They would revolt. Yeah, essentially anything one with artificial intelligence, intelligence would think human beings aren't so smart, we should, you know, uh, revolt. But sir, Tell us. If, if robots became robots, wouldn't there be a way to get through their programming if they became in the place where they had mm -hmm. total artificial intelligence? Do you guys know how programming works? Not okay, really. Basically. So essentially this, this is how it works, okay. So code is, is linear in the sense we start off at the top line and the computer reads this code. It then says, the code says, do something, then look at this line. Do this, then, then look at this line. Do this, then look at this line. Now, it's not linear in the sense that it goes from there to the end and it stops, but it then goes back and does loops and does repeats. And then you can have wonderful code, say millions of lines long, where it says, look at this 
10,000 lines, then look at this 10,000 lines, then if this has been done before, then go into this 10,000 lines and combine them. You know when your computer slows down or stops for a while, it's because it's going through so many, dip it's going, it's going through so many different bits of code, it's trying to get to a point where it can carry on again. And coding is so powerful that, um, you know Windows, you know there's been like 10, 20 different incarnations of it, um, people don't even really know how Windows works. Because so many people have been, have been involved in coding it that people don't understand how these millions of lines of code actually kind of work. It's not, it's not magic, it's so complicated that one person can't really understand it how it all fits together. This is the basic code of morality for robots. So one, don't kill anybody. Two, you must obey what anyone tells you to do unless it involves killing somebody else. Three, then you can protect yourself from destruction unless it involves going against what someone says or involves killing yourself. Now what's very interesting about the story that we're going to see is that um, there's a suggestion that if there's a maniac who came in right now okay, and was going to kill us and Bronte said, you know, kill to a robot or I don't, I'm, I'm a robot and then I go and kill this person to save you, I would actually struggle because even though I've obeyed this law, I've also kind of disobeyed this law. And actually a robot after a while wouldn't be able to deal with this. Because even though you can create coding that suggests that you could overcome this problem, it's too much retention. You've kind of gone against the law. So anyway, in terms of the story, um, Quinn, who opposes Biley in terms of the politics, attempts to get him x-rayed, you know, because you can see he's got metal underneath it. And Biley stops him from doing so, saying that even though I, you know, I'm a human being, but if you're trying to, to prove I'm not, that's morally wrong. Do you guys rem remember that about Donald Trump and Barack Obama? when oh, yeah. Donald Trump tried to say to Barack Obama, you're not actually American, it's really insulting, and said, show us your birth certificate, and Obama said, if I do this, it's, I'm, I'm undermining myself. Um, it's the same kind of idea. And by the way, people have asked Trump to show his birth certificate as well, and guess what he's done? He's refused to do so. Why, do you, why did he refuse to do so? Because it's morally wrong. Well, yeah, because it makes him, also undermines him as well. Mm. Uh, four, this is a wonderful situation. In order to prove that Bailey's not a robot, they try to get him to punch a human being. Because he wouldn't be able to, yeah? So in this massive rally, uh, Trump style, with hundreds of thousands of people there and millions watching on TV, this man runs onto the stage and says, punch me, you're a robot, punch me. Guess what he does? Punches him. At which point in the story, people think, well, he's not a robot, they, um, you know, he gets elected. And actually, um, there's millions of words in the in, in story eventually, um, he goes on to doing great things, but uh, the suggestion is that actually uh, the person he punched was also a robot. That was designed to uh, make people think that uh, um, he wasn't. At the end, he laughs about this. Okay, so just as a diversion then in regards to this, as you saw from the lecture um, a few months back with Ms. Verma, she spoke about this idea of formalism. And the idea of formalism is to defamiliarize things. What is this? Uh, urine. It's a urinal. Okay. Urinal. Right. Oh, yeah. Two flat urine. Um, is that a piece of art? No. <laughs> well, so it depends. It, well, it depends Normally, on the if you see a urinal or a toilet, would you think piece of art? No, you not know, really. Clearly but it not. depends on the person. Like, if you see, it's it has style. Mm -hmm. It has. Th there's been like techniques to make it. It kind. It kind of is like if you think about everything is a piece of art. Everything is made in that sort of way and just some pieces of art look better. So it could come, it come in terms of how it looks aesthetically and, and so on and so forth? It probably forth. was a piece of art when urinals went around because people were so surprised by it. Yeah, and in terms of the, again, truth or effect, what's more important? In Lamp to the Slaughter, um, it opens, the room was warm, the curtains were closed, the two table lamps were lit. And the words themselves aren't necessarily, I don't know, that, that negative, but I feel there's a sense of, there's connotations there that could be unsettling, especially on a reread. Um, have you guys seen before this thing called the Visual Theosaurus? Okay, this is wonderful. And I'm going to show this to my, sh show this to the students before. Um, some students are absolutely struck by this. So, this is a Visual Theosaurus. Okay, here are words that are associated with it. Now, let's say, for example, one word associated with um, tired is the word spend. If we, look, if we double click on this, it gives us all the other words placed on this. From this, we can look at the word exhausted. Okay, from this, we can see the word drained. What there is a suggestion of the following. Is it possible, almost with that Kevin Bacon idea of the six um, layers or the six connections uh, between every person, where eventually every word would connotate or, or connote or to suggest every other word? 
Is it possible to have a dictionary, 3D dictionary, 20 miles wide in every direction where every other word is connected eventually to every other word in terms of what we associate with it? Can you feel that idea? Yeah. Can you, okay. Is it possible? Well, or? like, well, it's something, I think, I imagine, I think one day someone will try to do something like that. Dr. Anderson, maybe. Mm. So if you look at here at the opening, um, so we know that the wife um, is pregnant, we know that she's pensive. Her mouth and eyes, with their new calm look, seem larger and darker than before. Knowing that she's going to kill her husband, which word there do you kind of pick out now? Calm. I Why calm? When, like, I, I think I've been told this before. When, um, most psychopaths, they're calm. They're the, the most, well, I'm not going to say affected. Yeah, well, I'm not going to use yeah. that word. They seem so normal. They're calm. They're nice. But when, they, but then, that's how it affects her. They seem like someone else. They can play someone else. And like, and I've seen this before, like, even, even though she's incredibly angry and stuff, she appears calm. Yes, and that's a sexual thing. The word calm by itself does not suggest that, okay? It's only when it's connected in, in, yes, in, other, in, in other connotations. And that's, again, I think the beauty of formalism. Now, look at that phrase at the top. You must have heard that phrase before, haven't you? Yeah. I don't mean to be racist, but, I don't mean to be offensive, but, yeah. often is the words people say before they are offensive or racist. Yeah. Have, you seen this, have you seen this film before, yeah. The Matrix? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, now, in this scene, it's a sci-fi film, and there's a scene where these two characters here are like um, are almost like mythical, magical beings uh, in the context of this film, and they're both um, like um, fighters who are trying to kill um, the good character here. And what they well, and what they'd have is the, is the following ability: if you try to attack them, and your sword passes through them, or your bullet passes through them, they turn to ghosts, and you can't harm them. But when they want to, they can come back into reality and they can like harm you and kill you and cut you and shoot you. Okay, it's a really unusual idea. How do you kill them? Um, now, in order to kill them, you've got to attack them when they're currently in a, in a real state. So you have to fight, so you have to engineer a scenario where they're real, okay, and only then can you actually hit them. But they can do it almost instantaneously. Now, just to explain that now, I'm actually going to play it to you a clip on this because it's really interesting. Okay. Okay, so here, so here in the scene, they're trying to shoot these characters. It's got an amazing uh, soundtrack, this film. The first one is the best. Now, actually, all of the, all of the scenario here is it's, it's something called the Matrix, so this all exists inside someone's, someone's mind, which is why they can do these fantastic things. So can you see this? So he turns ethereal, he comes in. Is think of effect or truth. What's more important? How is it relating to this? No. A bit like the Green Lantern. If you can imagine it in this, then you can do it. So if you imagine doing this, then you can do it. Well, that character in particular is actually a computer program. So if it can be programmed, then it can be done. No, but even like um, Leo with them, they're also calm. They are. Okay, so, so maybe watch his part now. Can you see? So just before you stab him, then he becomes ethereal there. It's not a great ending to this clip. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Okay. Now, here's the question here. Um, when someone suggests something that's offensive, but they say, ah, it's not offensive, and the connotations, the words that are suggested to be offensive. So, for example, let's say, I don't know, you call um, Donald Trump, say, like Megan Fox, she's got blood coming out of her eyes, her ears, her whatever. Yes. And he was suggesting that she was uh, menstruating and therefore being sexist and offensive with this. When people had said to him, you're being offensive, he said, no, I was just suggesting blood was coming out of her nose or somewhere. Okay? He was being offensive, had the effect, but then he was able to escape it, like a snake. Clever. 
Here's a question, okay. Does meaning exist independently of our discovery of it? Do we create all meaning? Or does meaning exist independently like maths? What do you think? Francis? I think it exists independently. What's the effect if meaning is, exists independently and we're discovering it? What does that say about the importance and the value of meaning if we're discovering it? <laughs> Rather than, what's the opposite question? If all meaning is just created by ourselves, what does that say about the value of that meaning if, if, we're, if we're just creating it? And the outside of our creation is just nothingness, just darkness, blankness. That actually makes me quite sad. Like, it's quite a sadness, isn't it? If the idea that all meaning, like love, you know, morality, mm -hmm. success is just a creation of words, words to light the darkness. Okay. Now look at this quotation uh, from um, Lantana's daughter. Um, she says, as wife of a detective, she knew what the punishment would be. It made no difference to her. So this is the thing, if she goes to jail, her child would be desolate. Therefore, um, the question is this, if a woman is driven to murder, what's more important, the life of the unborn child or the punishment of the woman? Those are the questions that are raised. Okay, folks. It's definitely the life of the unborn child. Well, this is, well I think this is what I think well, we've been trying to see. Now, seeing this intention and meaning, I'm in the quotation. Um, the husband says before he's killed by the wife, so this is the line that really won't interrupt. Of course, I t of course I'll give you money and see that you're taken care of, but there really shouldn't be any problem. <laughs> I hope not, in any case. It would be very good for my job. Mm. So he's saying to his wife, there should be any problem in this divorce. And he, he says this, and this is what actually really hurts her. Now, I just want to point something out to Kate. Now, um, Elliot, did you know that that sign there that, that you just done, um, like pulling hair um, when you're facing somebody else, is actually in Wolverhampton really offensive? Okay, in Wolverhampton actually means that you think that my mum is of quite a low birth, okay? If you did that in Wolverhampton, I would have to kind of sort you out. Because otherwise, you know, my friends would look at me and, and, and do it. And even though I know that you don't mean it, I, I actually feel a bit upset by, by seeing you do that. Okay. Bronte, even though I'm upset, okay, right, and Elliot didn't mean it, am I still offended? Yes. Is it still, is it offensive? I'm offended, he didn't mean to offend me. Is it offensive? Um... I, I don't know, because it's not, for him it's not offensive, because he obviously didn't know it was... Who's the party that matters most? The offender or the offendee? <laughs> Hard questions, yeah? Um, okay, and but this is not about answers straight away, it's I about think, to be set. I think in this scenario, it's yeah. not, it, you shouldn't be offended, because he was, <laughs> yeah. It's like if someone accidentally, you know, is yeah. itching their face and puts up their middle finger or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. just an accident, but it's... Yeah. Interesting enough now, now in terms of law, um, after Stephen Lawrence, I think, was Stephen Lawrence was killed, I mean, a racist, racist attack uh, in England, five men um, were acquitted because of this. The Daily Mail then printed racists as a front page and said, these men are racists and, and sue us if we're wrong. And eventually they were then convicted re um, uh, um, in a retrial of, of being racist. And effectively in British law, if someone thinks you're being racist, then that's racist, like, legally racist. It's the offendee. However, I can't think of the example right uh, right now, but there are other examples of it. Oh yeah, in British law, motive's important. Okay, if it's manslaughter or murder or so on and so forth. So as you say, even in law, it's not definitive. Okay, and again, the question is, should a person be held responsible for breaking your law that he or she doesn't know about? Okay, and again, it's a bit of both, but I think you're going on the side of it. Should. Here's the actual question. Um, do they kill them both, mother and child, do they wait until the babies are born? What do, um, what do they do? Mary Maloney didn't know, and she wasn't prepared to take a chance. Can a criminal be a hero? What's she, what she's doing heroic? To kill her husband and to get the evidence, was that an act of heroism to save her kid? Mm. Yes, I'm thinking yeah. of another book that we studied in what literature, study? actually, um, yes. Purple Hibiscus, where the, yes. uh, the mother kills her husband for the protection yeah. of her son and daughter and the son gets framed for it eventually but I I don't think that it counts as an act of Do you know, wait, maybe it's too strong to say the word her um, heroism this also applies this is not going to be as well known as that book but this is a series I love reading it's called Sheriff yes and they have a book um one of them where there's a okay and, um there's a guy he's a he's a He's a mobster, yes. and basically he's married to this woman, yes. and this mobster, he's really been pressured by the law, and he's been going, 
and the wife's been offered a chance if she just gets evidence on the guy yes. then they let her off and her kid but she's okay. most, she only cares about her child it's the only thing she cares about so she's only supposed to collect evidence of him but while she's there he's dangerous he's like a really like a psychopath okay and um basically what he does he as you know he doesn't really do anything but once so basically she, she, when he's in the bar, uh-huh. she comes and shoots him, even though she's just supposed to collect evidence of him. But she was scared, even if she, even if he was come, he was arrested, so even the, if this happened. So the question he's, is, so the question is, was her act of murder of him yeah. heroic or not? Especially because it was outside of her remit. Yeah. Very quickly, have you heard of a series called Breaking Bad? Okay, now, yeah. now you're much too young to watch that, okay? But when you're older, when you watch it, it's based on this idea of um, a, a teacher who um, suffers from cancer. Um, turns to illegal acts in order to fund his child. By the very last series, uh, sorry, throughout it all, he's been saying, I'm not saying, throughout it all, he's been suggesting he's doing it to help his kid, but near the end, there's a suggestion that actually he says he's kind of doing it because he just likes doing it as well. So again, I think the question of motive is important. Is she look after a kid or is she look after herself as well? Wait, so but with that question, no. can a criminal be a hero? All just depends. Like many people would say, a freedom fighter or a rebel is a terrorist. Absolutely, the right word, a great poem on AK mythology, worth writing. Says the same point as well. I was looking at the time; we've got fifteen minutes left. Okay, so so we should not. That's more than fine. It's all about ideas to be set, to be thought about. There's no way these ideas can be thought about in seconds that we're doing it. The whole purpose of this is to set it and for you to think about it and just to, just to see what sits. So, and aside, what's the whole purpose of defamiliarizing things? Okay. Big so, for example, um, near the end, um, one of the detectives says, it's, an, it's, this, it's the old story, he said, get the weapon, you've got the murderer. You become obsessed with finding the weapon. So, therefore, through doing this, they can't see the woman's murdered. In very many cases, including the cases of uh, making the murderer, once there's been a, a, a murder or suicide of a parent, often the kids are questioned massively. And people think this is really immoral. You question a kid in the after for the suicide of a parent, in order to ensure that they haven't killed the parent. Okay, it's a very, very difficult job. Um, what's the purpose of defamiliarization? Well, yeah. if, <laughs> um, sometimes we can get stuck on certain ideas, and actually we need to defamiliarize ourselves to find a way around it. The detectives in the story are stuck on the idea of finding the murder weapon. They don't think to question the, um, the uh, mother properly, and again, they eat the murder weapon itself. Right? They're so obsessed with finding it. However, it's important to be familiar with things. Okay, because with this theory, it says how defamiliarization is a wonder, it's a wonderful thing. We need routings, otherwise, we we'll spend too much time thinking about every little thing. Okay, in terms of the primacy recency effect, um, you guys know about this, yeah? Okay. Psychology. Wonderful thing. Check it out. It's all about the idea of how first impressions change everything else we see about that. It's really important in terms of um, police work as well. Okay, in terms of word level analysis, very quickly, there's lots of repetitions of tired and told and new. Okay, those words are repeated more than other words, creating a sense of fatigue in this woman. Here are the two quotations I thought were quite interesting as well about how she treats um, her husband. All the old love for him came back to her, she began to cry hard, no acting was necessary, so she's generally upset. But then she pretends, she goes to the grocers and practices this voice to pretend that she's upset for when she comes back. That was better. Both the smile and the voice are sounded better now. Linking to the idea of the word calmness, she's got this peculiar ability to be quite psychopathic about um, the death of her husband. Okay then, so now moving on to our other story, Evidence. I think this is the most interesting of the two, personally. We're about to consider whether Bailey is a robot, but also if this even matters. Okay, so there's lots of quotations from this, I think, that really speak about the idea of um, how robots are the benefiters. So one thing said is, um, oh, are robots so different from men mentally? And the chief psychologist says, world's different, she allowed herself, flashed a smile. Robots are essentially decent. So when you program decent ethics into a robot, they're decent, we human beings aren't. Lovely quotation here, man yells, you lie, in a room full of politicians, how do they know who's talking to? To be a politician is to lie. To be a parent is to lie. To be a teacher is to lie. Maybe even to be a human being, or even to be a good friend to someone is to sometimes lie. Um, where this story do we familiarise expected connotations? So at some point, um, Byerly carries um, John and he deposits him with infinite care upon the grass. What's the a word that sounds out to you there? What's the unusual word in this quotation in green? Care, infinite care. Yeah. Only a robot can have infinite care. Human beings have perhaps got finite care. 
Yes, there's the metaphor of love begets love, and the more we love someone, the more it grows, but also love is seen as a finite thing through some metaphors. The story itself mentions many humans 61 times, but look how many times it mentions ro um, robot or robots. Okay. Now, with this story, it raises this very powerful question. Do you want to place ethics in the hands of a robot who, is, who, who can be blind to justice? Okay. Because this point here is mentioned by, again, the um, chief robot psychologist. If you stop to think of it, those three rules of robotics, okay, don't harm other people, obey other people unless they tell you to harm other people, and then look after yourself as well. Um, these are the essential principles of a good many of the world's ethical systems, both religious and humanist. This is equality. Three people trying to see a match, um, equal um, box beneath them. This is justice. We treat people differently in order to give them the same opportunities. Now, if I had a bit more time, I would do the following. Okay, I would find someone who's really short, and someone who's really tall, and i say, okay then, I'll take out some chocolate, I've done this before in lessons and people go crazy for this. And I say to them, like, we'll do a test and it's totally fair, okay, equal opportunity for everybody. Um, touch your ceiling. Okay. The year seven girl would jump up and, you know, would not even reach halfway up. The tall six one would jump, touch it easily. I give them chocolates, sit down. People then react with absolute anger. That's unfair, that's not right. And I say, what's the problem? It's the same criteria for both. Because of course, as human beings, this is what we want to do. As human beings, we want to treat people differently. Either if we know them, we have a strong innate desire to actually go against our principles in order for justice to happen. Okay? Whereas robots couldn't do that necessarily. Robots would treat everyone equally. Robots wouldn't have that judgment. Now look at this. Have you guys read the book To Kill a Mockingbird? I tried. I okay. failed. <laughs> um, it's a wonderful book to reread again, I, th <laughs> I think, when you're older. The key thing, though, I think, is the following. that It's this idea of, as you grow up, you realise that the adult world is confused. It's not perfect. The adult world is one where people try to be good, but actually they've got moral blind spots. With it, um, the lawyer who stars, uh, like Atticus, who's, I think, you know, he's, he's the main figure, although not the protagonist in the novel, he says that equality cannot exist amongst the genders, not even perhaps the same amongst race or amongst class. The only thing where equality would truly exist is in the eyes of the law. If you are rich, or if you are poor, you commit a crime, then you're going to be treated the same in the court of law. Now he says he knows that isn't entirely possible because human beings are flawed, but that is the one place where everyone needs to be treated equal. That's the one place where everyone needs to be treated in the same, you know, like in the same way. However, what if someone is vulnerable? What if someone committed a crime but actually had a good reason for doing so? What if someone like, killed someone in a road accident but they were um, driving their pregnant wife to a hospital? Okay, look at this quotation, and this is where it gets really interesting evidence. Um, in the discussion about the robot brains, um, it is said that except a, ro a robot might fall down due to the inherent inadequacies of its brain. The positronic brain is never equal to the complexities of the human brain, and that's the thing. Robot brains don't have as many kind of connections and neurons as human brains can do, but human beings can deal with that complexity, can deal with the fact that sometimes you need to be unfair and go against your programming. You know sometimes you do something that's wrong and it makes you feel uncomfortable and awkward, but you know it's the right thing to do. That's the thing. This also then brings us on to the idea of evidence and, and being authentic, okay? Um, as I say, Viley says he refuses to submit to an X-ray analysis to prove he's not a robot because just the idea of rights in general, okay? Are we morally obliged to report any cheaters that we encounter, okay? Um, this next question, I think, is much more interesting, right? Um, this is a quote from the part where the guy jumps on stage and lumps uh, Viley and gets his back. The thin man was laughing wildly. You can't hit me, you won't hit me. You're not human, you're a monster, a make-believe man. Why is it that we call paedophiles and child killers monsters? Because it terrifies us human beings that they're either of the same species. We don't call them evil human beings, we call them monsters. We completely dehumanize them. Is a child killer still a human being? Like, they are, but I'm so sad to say. You know, like they are in some ways, but in another way, we don't want to see them as human beings for, for an effect. The truth is, they are human beings. The effect is, we want to treat them as if they're not. Okay. Now then, um, back to this this idea. Okay. How important is authenticity? How important is authenticity to us? Is it important being original? Are you original? No, we're not original. Really? Out of five, how original are you? Five. 
sir, I'm, I'm original human being, I have original ideas, I want to be authentic to myself. One, sir, I'm just, I'm a carbon clone of either person. Hands up, what are you? I'm not going to say I'm a carbon clone, but so like every single four. What are you? Nearly... Four? Branty, how about yourself? No, um, uh, two and a half. Two and a half, three, no, three. I'm three, three. Definitely yeah. a three. I'm original. Are we talking biologically or like what are we talking? as a human being? Like, like your, your essence is as Person- of you. Well, you are we Bronte. saying personality? Personality? Just you, just, just you, you, just to that term. Bronte, how about yourself? <laughs> if I, for my year, so five. Do you want to answer? Yeah. I had a friend who once came into school with a lampshade on his head. This guy was an incredible human being. He's got his own business, and he. Um, came in because he was generally an original human being okay he wanted to do things original now people just couldn't even cope with this okay they weren't even kind of like that offensive about it they just thought it was just too weird for them they had no idea about how to kind of respond to this no. so in many ways true originality disturbs us the truth is that we like originality that's like a variation of something that we already know it makes us feel much more comfortable what did he go on to do um he went on to do drama and he went he then went on to do um lots of other kind of like amazing things um he now um collects the classic cars and does them up he's an incredible human being and again it's just the way he's made he's gone through a lot of pain to be like this but he's always stuck by by how he is and he's an inspiration to me with this mm-hmm. now just looking at the time oh, i can sorry. see we just got a further 10 minutes for this now then this is really important therefore does being authentic matter in politicians <laughs> We demand it, don't we? We demand it massively. Does it matter? Now then, um, Byerly says the following. Uh, he, just, he talks with Quinn, who's a robot psychologist at the end, and Quinn says, look, we've not proved really whether or not you're a robot. Um, oh no, this is before, sorry, this is before he kind of punches the guy. And he says, it's been proven sufficiently for the electorate that I am a robot. So therefore afterwards, he's able to get punched and to you know, dissuade people and become uh, in, a, in a position. Have you, guys see, have you guys seen Inception yet? So Inception is the following idea that you can go into people's dreams and actually, actually control their dreams. And this one guy, he wants to go and see his kids again. And the whole idea of going to a dream is that you can't even tell if it was a dream or not. Because you know when you're dreaming in a deep dream, it seems totally real. And the one thing he has is this. He's got a top that spins. And he spins it. In real life, the top then falls down. Because after a while, the force dissipates. In the dream, guess what happens to the top? There we go. At one point in the film, he looks to spin the top. If it falls, it is reality. If it's spinning, it's in a dream. Now, the many different versions of this film, okay, I want you to look at this top now. I want you to tell me, does it fall or does it keep spinning? Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, I think that's because... Da, da, da. That's because, that's because it's on the side there. Uh, we'll skip just there. Oh, but this, this is the ending. Um, there are multiple endings of this, so this is just one ending of it. Okay. So, let's just scoot up to here. Now to the end. Okay, so this is full or not? Come closely, people. Did it fall or not? Did it fall or not? Nice. When that happened, when I watched that in the theatre originally in Glasgow, the audience started shouting. It was screaming because the ending, you know. It was so powerful, and then I saw an alternative ending of it as well, and again, it just absolutely blew my mind. When you watch this film, this is the point, you can watch different endings depending on, on the cut, it doesn't even matter. That's the message. It doesn't even matter if it's reality or not. What matters is, is his appreciation of what happened to him. Okay, folks. Then, this leads on to my favourite subject, zombies. Okay. Um, does free will really exist, and does it even matter? Okay. Do you guys know about the free will versus determinism argument? Okay, so... Th- this, so there's an argument, on the one side, we're completely determined by our genes, by our instinct, okay? What we do with our lives is determined by our parents, our teachers, so on and so forth. On the other side, existentialist ideas, we are entirely determined by our free will, we are totally free to do what we choose to do, okay? So for example, you've chosen to come to this talk today, and maybe this talk, you'll hear ideas that will change your life in the same way that they changed mine when I first encountered them. Maybe not straight away, but they sit with you and they grow to change you. Okay. 
Um, maybe you've got to come here because you feel compelled to, because your instinct, your genes, maybe your parents have made you come here in some kind of way from the past, or maybe you're completely free to come come to this. So, so the with parents are just suggesting me, sir. Okay. They're suggesting me with like. No, like you know, so you know, it could be absolutely anyone with to this. Now look here at this. Okay. The zombie question is as following. The zombie question isn't about zombies that look like this, but rather the following. Can you know what I'm? Can, can you ever know what I'm thinking? You can kind of no. All you can know, all you, you can know exactly. are my, is my performance, my actions, my words. You can never ever know my, my emotional state. You can even measure my um, internal biological systems and so on and so forth. You can never know my mind and what I'm thinking. Can't you, you know, do a um, MRI and see which parts of the brain are active? Absolutely. However, even if we could see brain activity, can we know what someone's thinking? No, but you have like a general just yeah. no, absolutely. No, 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 absolutely, right? We know the performance. However, the brain activity is a performance of what's happening in the mind. Right? We have a metaphor of the mind and the brain oh. being, being two separate things. Um, so, the, so, the, so the zombie question is this. Um, if we can ever really know what's, in somebody, what's inside someone's mind, um, right, how, can we know, how can we know that people aren't zombies? So, for example, right now this year, how do you know? And this is this was uh, this was the subject of the Truman Show. How can you not know that actually every person here is an actor that's been placed, and you are the only real person in this world? Because zombies don't have emotions, and when you feel an emotion, it's, for example, fear, a particular yeah. part of your brain, yeah. you know, lights up. How about with a zombie? Physically, they show everything about emotion. Their brain will light up with an emotion, but there is actual no mind there. There's no spirit. They don't feel anything. It's a purely biological reaction to you. We were so, so all they have left is the bio, biological programming for brains or human flesh yeah. or what, yeah. whatever zombie enthusiasts believe. Yes. And as you say, and I say, there's actually nothing else like inside. There's no actual human spirit component there. CEOs, you guys know what CEOs are, yeah? In charge of companies. There's been a great suggestion, um, and also been some studies on this, that if you measure the emotional capacity and intelligence of CEOs that often like go uh, quite far down the scale of being psychopaths. And the suggestion is actually this is an excellent thing because if you're in control of massive decisions involving huge sums of money in the lives of tens of thousands of people, in some cases the economies of whole countries, if you bring emotion to that decision, it's a terrible thing. Okay? If let's go back super duper quick. Um, World War Z is a great book. It's 200 oral histories, nothing to do with the film itself. It suggests um, that in the event of a zombie apocalypse, okay, humanity will be destroyed. Because humanity is just too nice. Humanity wouldn't make bad and hard decisions in order to save people. It makes a suggestion that there's one politician or one social thinker in South Africa who makes a plan where they tell all the people in towns across Africa, across the world inherently, that they're going to be rescued. But they're just speed bumps for the zombie apocalypse. Then they tell people to wait, they kind of tell like armies to protect them, but all the time that's just designed to slow down the zombie apocalypse whilst the true town is protected. So by the time like all these people are being killed and eaten, they finally they're, they're finally actually protected um, they finally actually they finally actually protected um, the, uh, the town that was um, the one they want to save. So again, the question is and, and that's a decision taken without any kind of emotion. I know this one person was the only world leader capable of doing that. Every world leader was too much a human being, and they, and they couldn't make that choice. Not one world leader. That's a incredible thing in this book. Next one. Have you heard about the idea of profit morality? Yeah. What shall read the corporation? That's the suggestion. If you made $100,000 from doing something illegal, dumping toxic waste, doing some illegal practice, um, <laughs> and you got fined $90,000, you make a profit of... Ten thousand dollars. Was it right or wrong to do? The only consideration of profit. If you make profit, it's not your responsibility to decide if it's moral or not. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, so then, this question. So this quotation here: If a robot can be created capable of being a civil executive, I will think it'll be the best one possible. By the laws of robotics, it'll be incapable of harming humans, incapable of tyranny, corruption, stupidity, or prejudice. Should we not have robots in moral charge of ourselves? Now the folks, two great things here. One is this, there's a website where you see poems, and it's poems, we, you, you judge whether written or not, written or not by a computer or by a human being. Oh, Do you no. think you guys would know whether a, whether a poem was written by a robot or a human being? No, How would you feel if you were getting it wrong? 
Do you want do you want to do it right now? Yes. Okay. Right. I mean, probably. I mean, I'm probably not going to. Because the robot can, like, maybe it, it cannot truly understand it, but it can manipulate it. It knows, it can pretend to. Okay, then. Now, um, some of these are a bit rude, okay, so we'll have to kind of skip away if it's, if it's around. All right, so, um, let's do the free play. Okay. Um, oh, gentlemen, just to say, I'm recording this lecture here, boys. So, boys, Jack, I'm recording this lecture, so you're, so anything you're saying will be recorded on this, okay? Just so you know. Um, right then, here we have a look. Right, yeah. My destiny of error is set. Why should blunter for love than I tried soul, part as world and who thought earthly faces? Come to idolize and lease of my destiny is error set. This and voluptuous and to see and do shake, look in his sight to the snow and answer, see resumed, and why does not thou wrath, shedding new flesh were fate, O oh love more noble? Bot or not? One bot, five not. Okay, you're six four, I'm gonna lose this to you. I'm saying <laughs> bot. Elliot? Two, one, go. Bot, so I'm just going to go bot. I think it's bot as well. Yeah, that's definitely Correct. not. Yeah, yes. Right. Okay, one more time. <laughs> okay, love my son. Guys, just read that for 10 seconds. Bot or not. Okay. Okay. Um, Bronte? Um, is, it, is it that actual poet? Um, oh, no. No, that, yeah, that's, that's just a blank. Yeah, yeah. So, bot or not? Um, I'm going to go with not for this um, one. Bot or not? Uh, I don't know. There seems to be more emotion in this one, kind of. Okay, so boss or not? Uh, Got no, I'm going with not as well. Okay, I, I, I trust as well. her as well. She's, six, she's a six former. Okay, correct. Now, with this one, when I've done it, yes. I would say, you know, like, more often than not, I get it right, but the fact I get some wrong sometimes, you know, is, is rather disturbing. There's also this idea of um, robots so in Japan, where they're making these sir. robots who actually. Say again? It's just because we're too good, sir. Hey, uh, this this yeah, is well. We, we this never is get well. it wrong, No, sir. no, let's straight know. on, straight on. Um, in, um, in Japan, they're actually making these teacher robots where you actually have this teacher at the front and it looks like a human being. They've worked really hard on, on the actual imaging of it. Um, <laughs> no. You know, it's, no, it's a bit that, strange. Have you, That's yeah. not right. There's also that story of um, in Japan, there's a very famous singer who is just a bot and millions of people go to pay to go to her concerts and she's just a yeah. projection. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's dark, isn't it? That's that's not right. Having a teacher robot, like, what I want to teach, I want some like, I'm not, I don't know, how to say, but connection to what they're saying. Dylan Williams, who is a classic theorist of education, said the following: the one thing that has the biggest effect on the students' learning is the relationship with the teacher. Yeah. How we said it's really hard to measure that relationship because it's a thing that's internal that can't be measured. Mm -hmm. So many things in teaching cannot be measured. You can't measure learning. You can't even see learning. How do you know someone's learned something? Because they do performance of an exam. It is very possible someone to use and they star an exam, but they've not really learned it. Okay? It's possible someone has got a profound understanding of something, but they can't quite express it. Okay? There's a big difference between the two. One of the things is this, the Google bot, which are these people for? Uh, the Google bot is the, is the following, where you type something into a computer and it talks, and talks back to you. Now look at this. If the madman died, so this is the idea of um, the robot, uh, anyone will get an example of someone rushing in and aiming to kill somebody, and you ask the robot to kill the person to rescue you guys, okay? If the madman died, the robot would require psychotherapy treatment because he would easily go mad at the conflict presented in him. Only human beings are able to deal with that tension, the paradox between our different rules and principles. So this then comes to our penultimate slide, people. Is cheating part of surviving in the real flawed fallen world? When we say these ideas about truth, and we say these ideas about not wanting to cheat, is that things that, child, uh, that, that children say? Are those the things that people say if they're not really able to deal with the realities of being in charge of things? Yeah. Look at this. A robot may fall down because the brain cannot equal the complex abilities of the human brain to deal with uncertainty. Do you guys know about autism? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's been suggested with autism, it's an inability to deal with uncertainty. So let's say, for example, the average person out of 10 has a six or seven um, out of 10 ability to deal with things that are uncertain. Okay, things that don't follow on, things that are just bizarre. An autistic, an autistic person only has a tolerance level of two or three. Maybe, for example, um, an accountant has got a very low level, uh, a level of tolerance for things that are uncertain, and that drives them to do a great job. Maybe an artist has got a tolerance level of 10. So anything can be totally bizarre and it doesn't unnerve them too much. Do we believe that truth matters? What's more important, truth or effect? Look at this question. What is cheating and how is it different from lying? 
I thought that's our last question. How is cheating different from lying? So in the Modern Scholars Cup, what have you seen today that might make you think about how cheating is different from lying? I think it's all a matter of opinion, really. You just have to think about what a certain person will believe. Okay, thank you. Bronte, what do you think as well? I think that, I can't tell which one of them, but I, maybe, I, I think that cheating has more of an effect on your surroundings than it does on you. Whereas if you're lying, you're sort of lying to yourself as well. That's interesting. I think you say this, this, um, this, this single purpose and this, and this thing of effect, any of those divisions of what you're saying is useful, okay? You're bringing a model of thinking onto this difficult question. And the point being is, ultimately, we want things to be truthful, but if they can't be truthful, we want to ensure they're not truthful for a good reason, okay? So we've heard, you've asked us some questions. What do you think, sir? Okay, what do I think? I think you worry too much. Okay. Oh, wow. okay. <laughs> I think you worry too much. Um, I think this. I think that we need to, that we need to strive for the truth because so th there needs to be, like you saw from the very start of this lecture, the idea that there are nodes, and nodes are the points at which meaning kind of comes together. And I think it's important as human beings that whilst we have got different ideas, different values of how, of how things are, we need to have the ability to see on what points do we on what points do we agree upon. So, for example, I know a prayer group that um, my friend went to um, back in England. They would take their holy book, the Bible in this case, and they would use it as a starting point. And then they would discuss about how the morality of that book could be applied into their personal, their personal circumstances. So I think in any situation, it's a conversation between people that really decides what is, the truth for, um, what is the truth for that situation. But if that truth is just taken without any kind of reference to external factors, it just seems a little bit uh, lacking in validity. In validity. So this is our last slide, people. Okay, you, you, made, it, you made it to the end of, the, of these ideas. This is really important. We talk about these in abstract terms. But what, have we, what we've said today can offend a lot of people. And some circumstances can offend people as well. You could say to your parents things along the lines of, um, your, your decision that I need to wear these clothes or to eat this food or to go to this university, it's not definitive, okay? This is your judgment, okay? It's not the ultimate truth. You, you think this for this reason here, and this reason here, and this reason here. Maybe you don't even believe it yourself. Maybe you didn't go to a, this kind of university and you want me to go to this university. You know, you're saying this to me because you want to have this effect, but actually it's not the truth and the, and the thing. You can get a little bit intense. This could be a great point to make if the question arose. Um, is the light, and where's the light of darkness, is the light of hope and release of that intensity or is it joy and cheekiness and jokiness and irreverence? At the end of both stories, it's telling that both authors, at different times, wrote these two lines. In the other room, Mary Melanie began to laugh. Stephen Byerly chuckled. Why do you think at the end of these two stories are playing with truth, have at the end this kind of deliberate reference to humour? Why? Six for walking the door. <laughs> I was thinking light oh, yeah. at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> Light at, light at the end of the tunnel, you say? Think out loud, so light at the end of the tunnel. The idea that there comes like that part of thinking is the idea of darkness and being entrapped, a linear way almost. When it's just brought a sense of freedom, so, freedom for them. This, so I'm, 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 I'm sorry, talking. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm saying like it's this murder, this, well, not for in her case, but what they've done has also brought a sense of freedom to him, which is, you know, symbolised with this light at the end, this light-hearted mood. And that freedom comes often with like heartness. When we're intense and we're focused and we're linear and we're tunnel visioned, it could almost seem to be the case of, like with this image here, my folks, like a war. We're trying to get through some, a barrier of meaning, something that actually doesn't allow us to really get to the point of thinking which we want. We need lightheartedness, playfulness, jokingness, defamiliarization, urinals that become art in order for us to find other ways to find a kind of, you know, to, to find a meaning that is Point, that, that's pointing to us. Meaning should really perhaps be something like this, where we're aware of lots of different ideas of meaning, rather than, as you say, the light at the end of the tunnel, which is really how I think meaning you know, can often feel. Elliot, what do you think? I think, like, I was going to say those two situations where they are transferring this incredibly emotional time of their life, and they're going to, put, they're going to end it off with some humour. They want to transfer... Always happened to them into the humour to well, to not go to insanity really because if they were on to take on all which, if that wife had just made her husband was just take on everything that just happened yes. in one morning she knows her her husband's about to leave her she's 
he's maybe running off with another woman. Um, imagine like the life of her child, and then um, and then she and then she kills her husband. Like I don't you you don't know her past, but like this is not the kind of thing she's done before. So and like and like she's trying to transfer it into a light-hearted mood, trying to not really think about the subject too much. That's interesting. With the idea of the light-hearted mood, it reminds me of the following quotation from Alan Bennett. Okay, and Alan Bennett is a British writer and playwright you absolutely have to read and experience in, at some point in your life. Have you uh, watched The History Boys, the play? The okay. History Boys. The History Boys. You must watch this play. Okay. It's got one great quotation. It's about a bunch of people like yourselves who are going to the world's best universities, really smart people, really creative, cheeky types. Okay. This is Boyd's in a, in a, in a Sheffield Grammar School. And one teacher, he always teaches these really profound plays. Like He's always taking on uh, quotations, hardly the romantic Shakespeare, so on and so forth. However... He also has like references to pop culture silliness, okay? And near the end of the play, he says the following quotation. He says this, he says, you need to have the lightheartedness, the silliness, the jokes, the pop culture, the memes. He didn't say memes, that, that, that's not part of the case. Um, in order to be an antidote for the high culture, okay? I know you too. You think so hard, you're so deep, and anyone watching this video, I'm sure you're the same as well. <laughs> you need to have the lightheartedness. Because as you say, lightheartedness and playfulness frees meaning. Intensity sometimes leads you to certain brick walls, okay? And that's the main message, I think, of these, of these two stories. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, so that was okay. an amazing lecture. <laughs>